Um, thank you, um, Despina, actually, for that fantastic introduction, um, because I think it, it, my, my talk will definitely be responding, I think, to a lot of those 
uh, um, questions, um, but in particular, uh, the ending question, which I'm going to actually talk about, <laughs> I think is part of sort of the introduction to the body of work. And I actually am going to show the African Burial Ground competition and this National African American competition um, to sort of see how this real scholarly stuff actually plays itself out in the design side of my work and my brain, basically. Um, but I do want to want to thank Despina um, for inviting me here and a chance to see old friends uh, and also to meet new people and to thank also uh, Rose and Glendora for putting together this fantastic exhibit. I mean, this really is a test run for this book uh, that I've, the book started as an idea um, and I'll talk a little bit about where that came from almost uh, 10 years ago. Um, and so it's nice to finally, you know, after jumping hurdles as a uh, dissertation and then to turn it into a book to really see what the public response is to um, kind of what you end up digging up in it, in, in your research. And I also just want to thank all of the groups, the AIA, um, the School of Architecture and Planning, Gender Institute, um, and the University Libraries for sponsoring this talk. And it's great to see that there are so many organizations that are coming together to sponsor, sponsor this, but I think it's indicative of the particular way in which the book covers so many different things and you know, sort of trying to bring them under one kind of umbrella of a set of ideas. So, so I shall start. Let me time myself. Hopefully this is about 45 minutes, so we'll see. So, um, to start. So this project uh, and writings matrix, I don't know how clear that is. It's probably, a little, unfortunately, it's showing up a little fuzzy. Oh man, it really isn't <laughs> showing up all that well. But it's actually um, a project and writing matrix that schematizes a selection of my work as an architect, artist, and cultural historian. So on the left is all the kind of scholarly work, and you can see it's organized by time. Uh, and so you can see at the top is Negro building and then kind of articles that I'm working on. So this sort of talks about the written work and any time basically there's a vector that goes over to the right side is the design work. And so some of the design work is what it is and this is, this is the selection of what I've done but it was kind of to show what these relationships are and then this kind of gets spatialized in terms of actually where the work was either shown or built or planned for on that side. There should be like a little thing in southern Sudan, but that's not actually, <laughs> we actually pull that off the matrix. Um, but anyway, so it gives you a sense of these kind of relationships both over time um, and space. So I want to comment on fields, disciplines, and bodies of knowledge in which this work is, um, yeah, in which this work um, is situated. And so this, I think, responds to the question. Um, if we take into account the spaces through which we practice our respective disciplines, the school, for example, modern educational institutions have partitioned bodies of knowledge into fields, so areas of departments, right? There's architecture and planning, uh, and schools. Uh, so we find history within the humanities, sociology and the social sciences, um, things like law and architecture in professional studies. Through their own particular disciplinary regimens, each group places value on the production of ideas, the cre which, which is really the creation, right? You make knowledge, you transfer knowledge, and you circulate knowledge, right? Because our goal as teachers is to transfer that knowledge to your brain's hard drives. Um, so, but disciplines also form social spheres, sets of social relationships, but they're also spatial, right? Um, so we often refer to them as fields because individuals stake out positions and are in turn positioned by others, reflected in part in the spatial divisions and allotment of spaces within universities, which is very interesting because there have been some shuffling around, I gather, of the School of Architecture and Planning, right, with, with certain renovations and so forth. Um, so it's both a social space and a physical space. Um, but most significantly, the production of knowledge within disciplines emerges within a, within a sphere of unequal power relations. When power is enacted within a field, groups determine what or who can participate within its sanctioned discursive, spatial, and visual territories. As we have learned, these processes of territorialization can also be arrested and redirected through the production of new knowledge. So if educational agents understand what is at stake in the creation of new ways of knowing or new ways, new inquiry, forms of inquiry, stalwart institutions of granite um, can also be jostled, moved, and fundamentally transformed over time. 
So my research, I'd like to think, travels through these various disciplinary territories. My creative trajectory has traversed disciplinary limits to engage in cross-border relationships and encounter the antagonisms between disciplines, fields, and professions. So my talk this evening will focus on two strands of my design and writing, race, space, and architecture, and cultural memory. So that would be the first and I think the third in this very fuzzy slide. Sorry about that. Um, good forward. The condensation of many years of research on these topics has been assembled into my forthcoming book. It is not Progress and Prospects, which was the, um, as the poster announced, but uh, and so that was out, <laughs> but Negro Buildings with the same subtitle. Uh, and as with any research project, one has to be open to discoveries and unexpected turns, like your editor absolutely hates your title. <laughs> and I found this out like a couple of months ago before the book, while the book was actually in production, so it's always interesting. So the seeds of this project were planted, or rather unearthed, with my interest in the documentation of the discovery of Lower Manhattan's um, African burial ground in the early 1990s. Oops. Uh, I published research on this topic in journal articles, and it probed the history of the colonial burial ground that functioned really as an abject site of internment because 18th century black Manhattanites were not allowed burial within the city proper. I also explored um, the recent battles that pit local activists against powerful, the powerful Government Services Administration, the GSA, to save the extant site from further desecration and, desecration and to erect a fitting memorial for the estimated 25,000 interred in the larger burial ground precinct. So this is what they actually uncovered. They were building a very large, um, they were built, not a large, but a, you know, like a 30 story high rise, I think designed by Cone, Pedersen and Fox. And they uncovered this burial ground, which had somewhat disappeared from the maps. So the conflict over the lost burial ground and how to commemorate it demonstrated how a constellation of historical and contemporary racial, political, and economic forces impacted the power of black Americans to claim symbolic representation in the nation's civic spaces. Drawing on this expertise, my practice, which was called KWA, so K was my partner, Paul Karayuk, uh, W was me, and A actually stood for anything because we saw ourselves as a multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary practice, along with our collaborators, who Despina mentioned, were selected as finalists from a national pool of, and so this was the burial site in 1999, which had basically been, the building was built behind, and then it was just this sort of covered over lawn for many, many, many years. So we were selected as finalists from a national pool of architects from the GSA's competition for this. Our entry, Sacred Ground, recognized the importance of maintaining the site as a hallowed place of burial through the creation of a public garden and memorial enclosure. So our position was to actually not build because there were, there were bodies actually still buried on the site itself. Um, we thought that the civic caretakers of the new garden would be charged with cultivating a collective memory of the burial ground and those who had been interred there. Um, because it had been literally erased from the maps and forgotten, how does that enter into the collective memory of various groups of people? Um, and so we imagined caretaking the garden would suddenly be this kind of ritual of literally um, remembering who had been buried here. So my, my early work on sites of black cultural memory provided an easy transition into the foundational themes of Negro building. While its chapters explore a range, this is the book, explore a range of topics from urban history to political and intellectual history, the preliminary research and articles studied the emergence of black history in cultural museums, um, many who were erected in the 1980s. And I wanted to understand how these institutions had taken root in formally segregated social and urban spaces, ones that often had very difficult um, histories of racial violence. So Birmingham, for example, uh, and this is um, one of the famous sort of iconic images of the civil rights struggle in Birmingham uh, in 63. This gets memorialized in a monument. Um, this is 1993. And then there's also the Civil, civil Rights Institute that was designed by Max Bond. Um, elsewhere, you have Memphis's National Civil Rights Museum that occupies the renovated Lorraine Motel where exhibits and programs memorialized the site where an assassin's bullet took the life of the civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr. 
And there's soon to be new additions to the growing list of museums. The most significant endeavor on the boards is the Smithsonian's new National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, and it, it's actually, a, it, that particular museum has a very long history. There were decades of racist elected officials that rejected citizen-led initiatives and debates about the efficacy of a national institution. And so the new 300,000 square foot museum and uh, research facility, which is designed by uh, a collaboration, Freelon Aj Bond, will finally rise on the last remaining, one of the last remaining unbuilt sites along the National Mall, right across from the National um, Monument. And I'll say more about this in, my, in the closing. So I'll actually show you the competition entry I did with Diller Scafidio Renfro, who designed Enkling Stubbins. So taking stock of these laudable advances, my book's research poses two questions. One is, what does it mean for black Americans to claim a physical space in the nation's symbolic cultural landscape? Two, what does it mean for black Americans to claim a symbolic space in the nation's historical consciousness? So one is conceptual, one is sort of the material condition of this, the, the space, the cities of our civic sphere. And I argue that these two have been spheres in which the presence and contributions of black Americans have been calculatingly rendered invisible for over, well over two centuries. Now, for the architectural and curatorial precedents to these contemporary black museums of history and culture, we actually need to look back over 100 years. So these get built in you know, the 1980s, uh, you know, sort of onward, the actual physical museums, even though the museum movement starts in the 60s. Uh, but the actual precursors to these things um, start in the latter part of the 19th century. Um, so we must look back over 100 years, beginning in the period after Reconstruction, to explore the great world's fairs, Negro buildings, that were first erected in 1895. And that's a Negro building. So, what is a Negro building? Uh, and this was my initial reaction when I saw this image in an archive. <laughs> and literally everybody thinks like, what in the world is that? But of course, when you start meandering through archival trails, um, you start to pick up on these, you, you go down these very unexpected paths. So looking at other Expositions I discovered there was a Negro building erected in Nashville in 1897 um, at its World's Fair, the Centennial. Uh, and there was another one in 1901 at Charleston's World Fair. Might this be a typology, perhaps? Um, and then one more at the Jamestown Exposition in 1907. And this one was actually designed by a black architect, uh, William Pittman. And there, there's another one that I, don't particularly, that I don't specifically write about. However, the last appearance of a Negro building of a typology uh, was in the, was the last time it appeared in a World's Fair was in Dallas in 1937. But why would the fairs, rather than museums, uh, be these early venues for the display of black life and culture um, in America. The fairs were temporary, not permanent, so that was critical. So you could only claim space for particular periods of time. And so that was very, very critical, which is why these things were actually very difficult to locate. Precursors to museums, permanent buildings with foundation, versus these things which often did not last very, very long, and they were event-based. The great architectural talents of the time, Olmsted, Daniel Burnham, uh, Louis Sullivan, Paul Cray, Raymond Hood, and others like the lesser known Bradford Gilbert, who I'll talk about, Vertner Tandy, William Pittman, built these phantasmal dream worlds that appeared for several months in metropolitan centers around the country. These men, and, occasion, and on occasion women, planned everything, the fairgrounds, the pavilions, and the layouts of exhibits. An enraptured audience of future workers, managers, and owners marveled at the colorfully festooned halls and toured the impressive pavilion structures. Amid these wide, open, sunlit interiors filled with machines and manufacturers that turned raw materials into products before their very eyes, visitors witnessed a stunning visual teleology and geopolitical atlas of how past and future innovations, industrial capitalism, could transform the lives and fortunes of the nation in order to lead the world. America's fairs paraded the nation's history as a national, as a natural outcome of an exceptional people destined to be great. 
These powerful white politicians, manufacturers, and transportation titans who set the ideological tone for the um, expositions in the US, and many of these are the same ones that funded our great museums, put the world from primitive to civilized on display so that the common sense of, na of nation, race, and class could be known by those privileged to witness these spectacles. So within this comparative framework, what and who was shown or excluded reinforced beliefs that historically non-white peoples belong in the lower ranks of civilization and the nation's advance. So a lot of this had been sort of thought through in racial science and so forth, but this was actually the materialization and visualization of these ideas. So this is actually from the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1875, and this family of man engraving visualizes the progress of civilization through women's bodies, of course. Um, so here we see America leading the way for Europe. They're sh shared, you see the shield of their shared patrimony, paternity. You see the dutiful noble savage, which is very interesting, the only male, um, as a threshold to the West. Um, and then you see timid Asia. She's wearing green and she's sort of kowtowing in some respects. And then you see primitive Africa with her rudimentary quiver of arrows, the hunter, the gatherer. What's also interesting that this was a mass-produced engraving for Leslie's Weekly, so that the image would circulate beyond the fairgrounds and also long after the pavilions were disassembled and the gates were closed. But also as a consequence of this racialized as well as spatialized social and cultural hierarchy, certain groups, especially Asians and Native Americans, Africans and American Negroes, were deemed exploitable for their resources and their labor. In particular, this confirmed that black peoples were incapable of reason and judgment and were therefore unworthy of basic human and democratic rights. Beyond the fairgrounds, it was collectively determined that given these natural limitations, black Americans should by law and custom be excluded from the public sphere. This was the logic of Jim Crow. They should be segregated into their own areas of the city and by extension of this logic, set apart in their own corner of the fairgrounds. This validated, as activist Ida B. Wells protested at the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893, the rise of Jim Crow du jour segregation and structured the dominance of white supremacy for decades to come. Now, what is a Negro building? The first one was erected for the Atlanta Cotton States and International Exposition held in Atlanta's Piedmont Park in the fall of 1895. Its contents was organized and curated by an emerging black elite class from Atlanta and from other parts of the South, where 90% of blacks still resided. Atlanta's exposition was organized by the city's white oligarchs. These were the railroad, business, and newspaper titans. And this group wanted to position Atlanta in its rail yards, because it was originally called Terminus, because it actually sat at the term terminus of these uh, railroad lines. Um, and so it's basically sprouted out um, from that network as a city. Um, so it wanted its rail yards as an industrial hub of what they christened as the New South. Uh, and they imagined the New South, as I say in the book, as a wily down-home cousin of uh, little cousin of its thriving kinfolk up north, which is Big Daddy Chicago. So in a way, they were sort of mirroring what had gone on in Chicago in the uh, Columbian World's Exposition, and they kind of wanted to position Atlanta in a very, very similar way. And so that's where the Negro building was actually located on the grounds. So to design the pavilions for their fairground, they hired Bradford Gilbert, a white New York, ar a white New York architect. Gilbert had designed the New York Railroad Building at the Chicago World's Fair and was fairly well known for his designs of railroad station, had already built a building that was very similar to the Flatiron Building in Atlanta already. So he was familiar to them um, both for his designs of these, these railroad stations and other sort of large kind of industrial scale buildings. Now, uh, and these are the pavilion designs. So as a cost-saving measure, Gilbert avoided the use of staff, which is a plaster-like material that had given the neoclassical buildings of the white city its, um, uh, its signature glow. And so for even though staff was used as a cost-saving measure in Chicago, 
it was still too expensive for the fair at Atlanta. And it was primarily because they had just gone through. There was a, there was a national depression at that, that moment. Um, and so a lot of the industries were, were um, particularly cotton and um, uh, pine, um, uh, lumber, uh, and turpentine, which were the primary industries, um, had, had lost a fair amount of money and businesses had closed. So instead, um, he, op he opted to erect the halls in a very angular neo-Romanesque style crafted from local Georgia pine, so that allowed local materials and resources to be on display. Now the final aesthetic of the pavilions reflected the dual nature of the New South's agenda. In some respects, the large clabbered halls with their spare classical detailing of columns and trim echoed the vernacular architecture of plantation homes that had long defined the economic and cultural character of the region. But in other ways, the great spans of the interiors capable of housing entire train engines captured the immense scale of the factory spaces that New South, booster, New South boosters hope would symbolize the region's future prosperity. So in celebration of this auspicious occasion of the fair, the Atlanta Constitution applauded one of the event's most unique symbols by proclaiming that the Paris Exposition, this is a quote, that the Paris Expositions had its Eiffel Tower. Um, the Chicago World's Fair had its Ferris wheel, but Atlanta had its Negro building. But why was the Negro building housing black accomplishment so important to the New South's ambitions? Erected in a corner of the fairgrounds, the Negro building was sandwiched between the body Midway Heights and the raucous grandstand of the Buffalo Bills Wild West show. So it wasn't accorded a kind of prominence position at all. It was constructed by, um, it was construction, it's construction by black workers and its displays of buggies and steam engines, sewing crafts and wood turning all demonstrated to white capitalists and citizens the immense potential of black wage laborers, workers who would man the New South's future factory. So the whole point was this would be the group of people who would work. And there was this absolute fear of the immigrant, they would say this, the immigrant rabble coming from the North, you know, these people who we don't know coming to work in our factories. So they figured these were the people who had formerly been our slaves, they are loyal and dutiful to us, so they would make these very, very loyal workers was the rationale. Uh, and so this is basically how the Negro building was laid out. I don't know why these are all showing up so fuzzy. Um, so the Negro building was also a tribute to the tenets of what were called, uh, what was called racial uplift. This was thrift, respectability, and hard work. Booker T. Washington, um, who was the powerful president of Tuskegee Institute and a, a major, major advocate of um, industrial education, was a key organizer of the Negro Building. And he claimed in his famous accommodation speech made at the opening day ceremonies that, quote, our greatest danger is that in that leap from slavery to freedom, we may have overlooked the fact that the masses of us still live by the production of our hands. So that's what he was saying to this opening. Um, uh, to the opening ceremony crowds. And it was very unusual that a black orator would actually be accorded a position in the opening day ceremony platforms. So this was just unheard of. And so they did it, and he, he made this very, very famous speech. So actually, this particular building is mentioned in the speech, but the speech is, you know, it's seminal, and, 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 and it was widely published. And even at the time, it went, literally went over the, the telegraphs and all the newspapers picked it up and they said, there's this great black Moses who is heralding the future of his race and so forth. So it was very, 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 very powerful and important speech that put this building on the, on, the, on the map, so to speak. So his straightforward metaphor in that speech of separate fingers representing a separate social order, so he basically said you have your left hand and your right hand, they join, right, but they nonetheless remain separate. Um, but mutually, so these things are separate social order, but they're mutually dependent races, races validated the rise of a segregationist mentality and acknowledged the Negro's place as a hand worker in the New South's economic order. So he even says, you know, we're not to be writing poetry, we should not be pursuing medicine or law, but we really have to learn how to be citizens through our hard physical, you know, through hard labor and through, through work. However, this message, uh, and these are some of the exhibits, um, this is Alcor A&M uh, Institute, it's their exhibit. Um, oh, 
back. Uh, and so this gives you a sense of kind of what was on, on being displayed. Although there were displays of painting and sculpture actually in the building. Uh, and there were, it's interesting because there were paintings by uh, Henry Osawa Tanner, who's a fairly well-known American painter, and so his paintings were in there. So there were these sort of, um, there was evidence of, of, of philo people writing philosophy and all of these literature. So that was in there as well, but the overall dominant theme was this question of industrial, industrial education. So however, this message of uplift, this message to uplift the race through industrial education was hindered by the caustic Jim Crow segregation that rationalized a separate provision to show black progress. There was also the poor treatment of black fairgoers, and then the denigrating depiction of coon shows, savage villages, and pancake hawking mammies seen on the fairgrounds. So there was a huge debate in Atlanta's black community and beyond about, well, if we take this separate pavilion, does that mean we're, we're accepting Jim Crow? Does that mean if we visit from the north and we come here to see this, are we going to have to sh shift to a segregated um, rail car just below the Mason-Dixon line? So people knew what the implication of a separate pavilion actually meant, and it was hotly debated. But nonetheless, it was like, we can see. This was a, a chance to show what we have done since we've been emancipated. And so that's why this particular thing went forward. And yet you get the old plantation concession on the midway. However, there were more radical ideas about black history and progress, such as the willingness to confront this growing anti-black racism and segregation that circulated within the Negro building. So there was a debate about all of this stuff and there were people who had different positions, uh, as well as around Atlanta and the nation as a whole. So enter this person. Uh, and so now I'm gonna talk about this particular fair. So enter W.E.E.B., William Edward Burgart Du Bois. He's a sociologist, and he was the first black doctoral graduate of Harvard University. He arrives in Atlanta in 1897 to teach at Atlanta University. He had been hired to organize what were called the Atlanta Conferences, a yearly study of Negro life in cities. So it was actually a kind of response to what were called the Tuskegee Conferences, was a study of Negro life in the country. And so there was a belief that, no, actually, the cities are growing and blacks are moving there, particularly in the South, Atlanta's growing. Why shouldn't we do these sociolog use this new body of knowledge, sociology, to study what's happening? Um, and what's interesting about that first Atlanta conference before he arrived, it was scheduled to actually be part of the Congresses at the Negro Building, but it never happened, and it happened a year later in 1896. So in 1899, a college friend and fellow educator, Thomas Junius Calloway, T.J. Calloway, contacted Du Bois about contributing to a sociological study that was being called the American Negro Exhibit. The exhibit will hang in the Pavilion of Sociology, Pavilion of Social Economy, on the grounds of Paris's Grand Exposition Universelle that opened in the spring of 1900. Calloway, who had been a commissioner, um, to Atlanta's Negro Building, so he had been a commissioner from Alabama actually for the Negro Building, um, promised that the Paris Exposition would provide another extraordinary opportunity for blacks to show how far they had advanced in America since slavery. Calloway had worked for Booker T. Washington um, and had shared, and shared similar views on racial uplift. To rally support and to secure exhibits, Calloway reminded um, blacks of the that the relevance of showcasing Negro self-improvement had already proven as a means to advance the economic and social standing of the race. As an example, he noted that, quote, the success of the Negro exhibits at the Nashville and Atlanta expositions has opened up several factories for Negro labor and crystallized strong sentiment in many parts favoring him as an operative. So he was already sort of recognizing the advantage of having these public forums of display in terms of creating new economic opportunities for black Americans. Now the social economy pavilion, in comparison to many of the uh, fairgrounds, lavish halls, was a very, very simple, there, the, the, I don't know if, if you don't know that exposition, there are these incredible Art Nouveau buildings that were actually built in Paris for that particular fair. But this, however, was a very simple white neoclassical building erected along the Seine. So the pavilion was where U.S. public charities and social reform organizations such as settlement houses, cooperatives, trade unions, tenement improvement associations, and you could see the tenement models in this particular image, health organizations and Negro self-improvement associations set up exhibits. 
These organizations displayed their successes at disciplining and improving the welfare of America's less capable charges. It's children, workers, infirm citizens, and Negroes. The limited space, along with the need to present pamphlets, statistical charts, diagrams, maps, photographs, lanterns, and models, meant that American organizers had to conceive of an ingenious display uh, to show multiple formats of information. So what was unusual about the Pavilion of Social Economy, which was an idea conceived by this, this um, uh, sociologist named Ferdinand de uh, Leplay, who actually was the mastermind behind the whole classification system of ex expositions, I think, uh, going back to expositions prior to this, was that everything was going to be classified and organized. But usually what you saw was the actual thing. And what this pavilion was going to show was a representation of the thing. So it was, it was about data and information, which is why this is very interesting. So you would actually see statistics and charts and all of that stuff that was showing progress. Rather than seeing the steam engine, you would see like statistics on how many steam engines there were in a particular place. So it's actually a very interesting pavilion in that regard. So tackling this problem of how to show all of this information in the space, um, the New Jersey School and Church Furniture Company designed a unique system of wing frames and wall cabinets to accommodate the mini exhibits in the cramped space. So I think you can see here, right, these are the wing frames and there are cabinets that kept things low. And so things were actually placed very, very high. There were models in, in the space, lots of books. Right, and so there was this very interesting ingenious way in which everything was kind of sort of organized uh, and then cataloged into these various kind of um, ex exhibition um, vitrines and so forth. So the American exhibit, um, the American Negro exhibit was laid out in an L-shaped configuration and fitted out with exactly the same wood, wooden shelving and display systems utilized throughout the US's um, exhibit. And so we were looking actually across this way here and this is where the American Negro exhibit is. And they also had certain, I think they had a couple of spaces here and here as well for the American Negro um, exhibit. So this shows you um, Equitable Life Assurance Company, the League for Social Services. So these were, uh, many of them were actually progressive institutions that were showing um, their accomplishments in this particular, particular space. And so this is what the American Negro exhibit actually looked like. And you can see these were the wing, wing frames. Um, these are various charts. Um, there were lots of photographs as evidence of what was going on. So it was very early use of photography and fairs and so forth. Um, so the American exhibit was laid out in this L configuration. And it's, it was a much smaller endeavor than the Negro building in Atlanta. But the exhibit's extensive documentation of photographs, books, newspapers, and artworks, as well as industrial artifacts such as patents and products, illustrated a complex panorama of contemporary black life in America. Departing from the Atlanta Exposition, where Southern fair builders had clearly segregated the Negro building from the other main pavilions, marginalizing it near the entertainment venues, White curators presented the American Negro as an integral part of the whole U.S. endeavor. So materials on display emphasized how industrial education bettered the fortunes of the nation's black masses. Photographs that captured well-appointed single-family homes whose residents adorned the exteriors with modest Victorian and Queen Anne detailing were placed near contrasting views of mud chimney cabinets. And so what's interesting is the view on the left is um, actually the home of Bishop Gaines, who was a very, very key booster for the Negro building in Atlanta, for example. So there was this literally the narrative of progress. See, this is how far you can you can go, right, um, in terms of what education and wealth uh, and bourgeois propriety will, will, will get you. Um, so Calloway engaged the talents of Daniel P. Murray, who was a brilliant assistant librarian at the Library of Congress. He entrusted Murray with the task of assembling an extensive collection of books, newspapers, and sheet music for display. Uh, Calloway must have been acutely aware of the implications of this choice since the Library of Congress's authority would offer irrefutable proof of black literary achievement. Um, and so that's where Daniel Murray's books of Phyllis Wheatley, Du Bois, uh, du Bois's Philadelphia Negro Study was included in their books by Washington, um, various novels. Um, so there was a huge collection and also a number of newspapers um, were also, also made available. Uh, but what's also interesting is that Murray's home was also photographed and then shown because he was a representative, right, of black progress. Um, 
So in keeping with the mandate of industrial education for the Negro, 17 hinged vitrines positioned at high, eye height and placed on the central wall of the exhibition area contained workshop and agricultural samples from Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee um, Institute. So that's an image of Booker T. Washington. And he was also key in getting money for this particular exhibition. He basically had the ear of McKinley, the president, uh, met with him, wrote a letter, then met with him and basically asked for money to, to fund this. So Washington had grown in power exponentially in five, five years. Um, and so here were all of the things Tuskegee had actually manufactured. So you had sewing examples even in, in these particular um, vitrines. So you see the things that people were making with their hands. So, um, so in the central of the exhibition, you saw workshop and agricultural samples from Tuskegee. The school also contributed a series of fo uh, large photo montages of the campus buildings that showed fields of crops and students in industrial training, um, industrial training classes. So, so these were the kinds of images that showed what life at Tuskegee was actually like. Now, although Washington's authoritarian hand loomed as a formidable presence, in the content of the American Negro exhibit, Du Bois's own carefully crafted interpretation of racial progress challenged the powerful race leader's impressive reach. So below the vitrines exhibiting Tuskegee's submission, fairgoers, fairgoers could examine the plates and review the data from Du Bois's Georgia Negro study. So rather than show artifacts of rural life and products of manual training, as did the contents of Atlanta's Negro building, and the nearby Tuskegee offering, the Georgia Negro study presented a scientific analysis. In one of its first place, plates, Du Bois located Georgia within the routes between Africa and the Americas during the, um, during the African slave trade, indicating the vast extent of what we now identify as the African diaspora. This introductory map drew a historical and spatial sphere in which black life in Georgia was situated. situated. In spite of the efforts by whites to position blacks outside of the march of social progress, this first plate confirmed that peoples of African descent throughout the world, including those in Georgia, have participated in and would continue to contribute to the forward advance of civilization, and by association, of course, capitalism. Other charts educated viewers on the growth of the black population in the US. There were charts that showed the distribution between people who were living in the city versus rural populations. Um, there were statistics regarding educational enrollment, land holding, what was called miscegenation, marital status, and the distribution of religious denominations. And what's phenomenal are the sort of abstract depictions that, that are shown in these particular um, plates, which are really, really beautiful. Like you can find the plates on microfilm and they're only now actually starting to, sh to, to photograph them in color. And so you, most people had no idea how color was actually being used in these particular, uh, in these particular um, charts, even though people have writ written about them in, in other ways. So, so the fair's judges confirmed gold medals on Du Bois's Georgia Negro display and Washington's Tuskegee exhibit. But the real triumph occurred when the entire American Negro exhibit received the highly coveted Grand Prix. So it was premiated amongst all the exhibits actually within the larger fair. Du Bois's survey of Atlanta's and Georgia's blacks, whose introductory plate included the pronouncement that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, which actually appears later in his Souls of Black Folks, but actually appears first in this graphic representation. Um, proved that blacks in America had elevated their status and would continue to advance their welfare despite toiling against the caustic effects of racial segregation and violence, a topic that Booker T. Washington had evaded in his much lauded Atlanta presentation five years ago. So Washington was arguing, oh, we'll sort of be, we'll accommodate disenfranchisement from being able to work and being able to vote, so long as you allow us to incrementally move ourselves forward. And Du Bois clearly had another position. So I'm going to talk briefly about the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo. Hearing of the wonderful international reception of the American Negro exhibit, citizens of Buffalo, in particular members of the Phyllis Wheatley Club of Colored Women, contacted Callaway. 
They hope to bring the award-winning exhibit from Paris to join their own exhibit on black progress at the Pan American Exposition being planned for the city in 1901. Sorry, that, is that right? No, 1900. No, 1901. <laughs> no, it's 1901, right? Yeah, that's my mistake on the slide. Um, so just a little bit about the layout of the fairgrounds. Architects of the Pan American Exposition laid out the extensive fairgrounds on 350 acres of New York farmland. In an aesthetic move to transcend the earlier Chicago's exposition's monochromatic white city, whose whiteness symbolized an east-west axis of Euro-American cultural superiority, the Pan-American planners chose to fully represent a polychromatic north-south racial progression. As planned, visitors entering into the rainbow, what was called the Rainbow City's esplanade, Esplanade first witnessed cruder barbarian colors of reds, yellows, blues, and greens. After this primary, primary color assortment, their views shifted to the middle ground pavilions whose refined color palette lightened to pale gray, blue, and buff hues. Finally, in the distance, their gazes lighted upon a crescendo of ivory and white hues enveloping the beacon of the electric tower, which at night beamed a great searchlight to illuminate the noble prospect beyond. With hierarchies of race and nation as the framework, a narrative of civilization was carefully embedded in the visual and spatial order of the fairgrounds, as it had been at other fairs. Now, the reports of the, uh, the, reports of the award-winning Parisian exhibit and the success of the Negro buildings in Atlanta and Nashville inspired other groups to want to display their accomplishments in, in local efforts at social advancement. The members of the Phyllis Wheatley Club were adamant about having black representation at the forthcoming Buffalo Exposition. A determined coalition that included clubwoman Mary Burnett Talbert and attorney journalist James A. Ross protested to the Pan American Exposition Board in the fall of 1900 about the exclusion of black involvement. By the time Calloway arrived, um, at the end of the year, to propose the exhibit, the governing board, some of whom had attended the Atlanta Fair and witnessed the success of the Negro building there, was willing to incorporate the, the American Negro exhibit into the displays at the Pan American Exposition. And so you can see T.J. Calloway um, there, and that I believe is James A. Ross, um, who is sitting in the space. The vitrines, maps, and photographs of the American Negro exhibit filled a corner of the social economy section in the sprawling liberal arts building. Under the stewardship of Ross, mentioned in one newspaper as the assistant in charge of the Negro exhibits, Calloway and Du Bois's entire exhibit was on hand with additional material to highlight local issues and people. Uh, and so uh, that's the exhibit in that particular, how it was laid out. And then you can see again where that material reappears and how it was laid out um, in the um, Pan American Exposition. However, despite the American Negroes, exhibit, uh, ne American Negroes exhibit's exquisitely crafted message of progress, racist propaganda, as it, as it had been at other US fairs, could be seen around Buffalo's Rainbow City. Buttressing the exposition's social Darwinist theme seen elsewhere on the fairgrounds, the Darkest Africa attraction, a village of 98 Africans funded by the Buffalo Society of Natural Sciences, and across the way yet another old plantation concession proved popular venues along the Pan Americans Midway. Keenly aware of the value of black participation at Atlanta, Paris, and now Buffalo, Booker T. Washington campaigned for Charleston, South Carolina Interstate and West Indian Exposition to have its own Negro building. Washington made his request to fair planners, even though the state and municipal legislatures of South Carolina had been the most aggressive in disenfranchising black male voters from their con constitutional rights to cast ballots and their rights to be elected to political office. So many blacks had actually been elected to political office around the South right after Reconstruction, and then slowly, bit by bit, they were pushed out of office, you know, as black male voters were disenfranchised in various ways from being able to, to, cast, to cast votes. But many also sought political appointments. So you couldn't be elected, but you potentially could find a political appointment. And because Washington had the ear of so many powerful people, he sort of became a power broker in that regard and got people particular jobs like uh, tax assessor or, or you know, um, other kind of um, uh, civil, civil service positions. 
So to avoid large crowds sauntering about the fairgrounds in Charleston's stifling summer heat, it's very hot and humid if you've ever been to Charleston, the fair builders who once again hired Bradford Gilbert to design the pavilions planned to commence the exposition in the temperate month of December 1901, opening its gates one month after the Pan American Exposition closed. Now, holding steadfast to Old South traditions, rather than the Upland's New South agenda, white organizers initially proposed, uh, and this is the Negro building as designed by Bradford Gilbert, they initially proposed that the Negro building's aesthetic decor should recall that of the nearby antebellum cotton and rice plantations. In keeping with Old South nostalgia, they even planned to recreate slave quarters surrounding the homestead to best showcase showcase the development of the Negro race. Now, as designed by Gilbert and built by black work crews, um, a Spanish mission-style pavilion housed Charleston's collection representing Negro industriousness, which was fortunately displayed without the historical recreation of slave dependencies. T.J. Calloway was briefly involved with preparations for the Charleston event, so was Daniel P. Murray, and his award-winning American Negro exhibit, including Du Bois' Georgia Negro Study, was featured as one of the Negro building's main displays. Except for the presence of Du Bois' finely honed sociological and historical analysis of the impact of anti-black racism in, um, I should show you, these are some of the interior images. And on the left is Hampton Institute's uh, um, display. Again, you can see this question of like craft production in these, these displays. So the building deliberately shunned any explicit protest of social inequalities or the question of suffrage, of you know, the fact that people didn't have this right to vote, black men didn't have this right to vote. Led by Washington and his mandate of patient accommodation, black organizers seemed unwilling to antagonize their white patrons. Now the seamless representation of the cooperative Southern Negro at the Charleston Fair was shattered, however, by a divisive row over the, row over the installation of a large statue that paid uh, um, homage to the region's plantation culture. So in his role as chief architect, Bradford Gilbert envisioned for the front of the stately main court of palaces, four statues depicting the original groups of the region. Now, the chief architect proposed that a 16-foot tall sculpture of the Negro group be placed in front of the Negro building instead of the main court with the other statues. So for Gilbert's interpretation of Negro progress, artist George A. Lopez carved a stalwart negress in full stride balancing a basket overflowing with cotton pickings on her head. She stood adjacent to a crouching blacksmith hammering away at, a, at an anvil whose well-worked muscles told a life dedicated to manual labor. Rounding out the trio sat a jovial banjo player smiling and strumming away on his cherished instrument. This animated, larger-than-life trio possessed distinctly African features, negating the historical reality that many blacks in the South, because of centuries of miscegenation, possess decidedly Euro-American features. The stereotypical representation, symbolically positioned by white organizers in front of black Charlestonians' temple to racial progress, deeply insulted blacks, especially the educated leadership who complained to the organizing committee. Eventually relenting, the apologetic Booker T. Washington had the offensive sculpture carted away. But the white fair administrators, confident and proud of their homage to Negro progress, simply relocated their gift to a more prominent site on the fairgrounds before the commencement of the fair, which ran from December to May. Insulted by the repositioning of the demeaning ensemble and the jury's award, um, and the jury's award, I think it received a silver medal, actually, um, black patrons, a significant portion of the fair's likely audience, boycotted the exposition. So they realized, I mean, I think Charleston was 60% black at that time. So they just realized, well, if we don't show, they're not going to get revenue. Um, so for, for ambitious white organizer, the interstate and West Indian exposition was ruled after the ticket receipts had been totaled a financial fiasco. To conclude, 
Why were the fairs important precursors to the current black museums? Because the expositions were in fact public spheres in public spaces, they were open, if unintentionally, to alternative representations of American industry, culture, and national identity. When confronted with these powerful and persuasive narratives of civilization, black Americans used fairs to vigorously respond to how they were being portrayed and positioned. Washington, Du Bois, Calloway, and a host of other fair builders sought to disprove the bleak forecasts augured by their fellow white citizens by taking measure of their own advancement. Inside the ideologically charged atmospheres of the mainstream fairs, Negro buildings in Atlanta, Charleston, Jamestown, and eventually at black organized emancipation expositions in New York and in Chicago, the spacious wood and stone halls offered prospects where black citizens could witness their own progress as a race and as a nation. Groups of black citizens form, formulated bold counter-narratives to American progress. They created public spaces where disenfranchised blacks from all across the African diaspora could imagine a world free from subjugation. At the expositions and eventually at the early, what I call early grass roots museums of the 1960s in Chicago, which is the, what's currently the DuSable Museum, which started as the Ebony Museum in a residence on the south side, uh, but also in Detroit, which had a very, very interesting strategy of creating this sort of itinerant mobile museum that could, could travel um, around the city. Um, these institutions offered a range of strategies. So we see accommodation to the civil rights of Du Bois. But there was also the self-determination of black nationalism uh, and also the alternative national belonging of Pan-Africanism. So all of these things were appearing in these, in, in these public spheres. These complementary and conflicting strategies were all aimed toward elevating their collective fortunes against the rising tide of anti-black racism in the United States and around the world. Negro building tells the story of their visionary responses in daring propositions. So this is actually the Detroit Museum in its current state, and this is actually the second building it's now housed in, and it's named after the founder, Charles Wright. Um, so, you know, this is 1996, so you get this progression where, which I think is very interesting, the Wright Museum also started in a residence, just like the DuSable, so it starts in Wright's former home, uh, and then eventually, this this idea that this museum moves around, so it's very itinerant and mobile. Uh, and then eventually, it becomes a very traditional, conventional museum. And it's literally, it's got foundations, it doesn't move. It's got the iconic dome, one could say, of Schinkel. Uh, and so it sort of operates as a very, very traditional museum. So it has this very radical legacy of these Negro buildings, to these emancipation fairs, which I write about extensively in the book, to the early history of these, these kind of militant museums, um, in a way. Uh, and so part of what you know, I'm also trying to say is that this National Museum has inherited part of this legacy. It's a part of this, which starts, that National Museum, the, the desire to actually build one starts in 1915 as a kind of civil rights protest uh, for a desire to have a monument to black soldiers who have served and fought for the nation. And it goes through several iterations in the 1920s and the 1930s, it appears in the 60s. There is a National Museum that gets built in the 1980s way out in Chicago a national museum in Chicago, rather than in the sort of home of American patrimony, which is Washington, D.C. 1990s, it reappears, um, it gets proposed, Jesse Helms slaughters it. Uh, and then finally, um, in the early part of the 21st century, it reappears, Hillary Clinton's a big booster, George Bush actually signs the law, and it's now being built. So there was this competition um, in 2009 to actually design the new museum. Uh, and so I want to end with a project to show how the scholarly research of these ideas migrate back to the design side. Um, and so I'm going to show an architectural proposal for the Smithsonian's new museum. Um, I worked with um, Diller Scafidio Renfro, um, Kling Stubbins was our uh, uh, DC-based firm, and we worked with um, Walter Hood of Hood Design out in, out in Oakland. So, yeah. So this is what I mean. It goes from the right to the, to the left to the right. Um, so, let me get out of here. And so this is just, I'm just going to show you the animation we did for the project.
hurt and she trembled. Had it been possible for a corpse to speak, she would have said, you are wrong, I am going to meet my friends. All they could see was a girl slumped in a dirty puddle and not the one soaring and on her way home. My name is Houghton Hughes. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note. Kunta Kinte, my family is well. They'll be coming after us. possible for a corpse to speak, she would have said, you are wrong. I am Thank you. Afterlife in a way, you know, like Liz Rick and, and Walter uh, and Alberto and I, after we were done and we didn't win, it was like, well, God, it was almost like, thank God we don't have to deal with that project because it's just, you know, imagine building something of that scale for the U.S. government and, and what that entails. So, so that project is what it is, but I am doing a project called Becoming History because I also, there's a huge cache of images um, from the exhibits that I discovered. Uh, and so I'm interested in literally represencing those images through sort of an interactive uh, um, projection project. So, so I've been thinking about this for many years. <laughs> um, and so I'm sort of starting that. And I think I have a sense of the form. And I've actually been trying to write grants to do it. And I started doing video work um, a few years ago. I taught video for a number of years, but started doing my own video work as well. So, yeah. I'm more familiar with World Fairs, where the United States has. I'm 
I'm trying to think of other examples elsewhere because I don't really look outside the United States except for this particular Paris exposition. Um, so that is a really good question that I have to say I don't know, but that's a good one. <laughs> I mean, it's a good, it's a good question about how. Um, you know, I, there, there are a number of other expositions. I look at a number of emancipation expositions. Uh, there's an, an exhibit at the Philadelphia Sesquicentennial in 1926. There's uh, a number of these, I write about, about five or six emancipation expositions, which are black organized. Um, yeah, which go all the, those go all the way up to 1963, but I don't look at another international fair. And so that is actually a really good question that I'm hoping, since this is the first sort of comprehensive study of these, that somebody will pick up that thread. But it's a really good point, actually, and something I had not thought about, but it would be very interesting to look, look that up in a way. strategy that we came up for this building that actually set, I mean, there were very, I, I explained this to Miriam's class actually today, there were very pragmatic issues about where are you going to put the loading dock? Like, I mean, that was it. <laughs> that was the thing that determined, like, how are you going to orient the building? Um, and, but there was this other thing where the program, which is like, I don't know, like a 2,000 page programming document, I mean, it was insane. And we had three months to figure out this puzzle. Um, and so they had a his, set of history, history galleries and they had a set of cultural galleries. And so we realized, well, you can't have one without the other, and that we thought it would be really important to be going through this kind of history sequence. And they, they, they said they were very different. Culture would be thematic rooms, right? They were to be thematic areas. They gave us square footage. And then they said, well, the history has to unfold linearly, right? So we, all, we just knew it had to be some kind of linear progression through the building. So we just said, well, you can't really understand culture without some historical perspective or history without having some kind of enriched cultural perspective in terms of how it plays out. Um, and so the way we configured it was there's the ship at the core, then there are the cultural galleries which get stacked, so they stay their own thematic, and then we wrap the history around so there are these moments where you can actually very directly move from one to the other. And they propose these things called Lynn spaces that might have artworks or something. So you then see the concept filtered through the lens by, like we showed it with Carrie Mae Weems. So she takes a very famous image of, a, uh, of, of uh, an elderly slave and she works with these in her own photographs. And so. Through, this, it, through that video actually, or the, I think it's the renderings where you see it, you come through this gallery that might be about slavery, but then you can go through the lens, you see Carrie May's work, and then you go right into a gallery that sort of might deal with some cultural issue. Uh, and so that's how we started to kind of think more radically about the, the and there were also issues around representation. Should there be a, over Africanist or Afrocentric representations? And, we just decided as a team we were going to go abstract. <laughs> and I don't think that, I mean, that just, that's just what it was. And, and so, yeah, so it was a position. I don't necessarily think it, people think got it. it. in the program they said they wanted they have this sort of remnant of a slave ship and that was supposed to be in the great hall but the great hall was also supposed to be used for entertainment you know for writing so who knows 
And we thought, well, that would be very odd. You'd be having a party, and here's this hall of the slave ship. So we decided to make that the core. And you know, we wanted to deal with the question of the representation of slavery, so that's why we use that famous image on glass. Um, so you see the artifact, but you also see the representation of the artifact. So it has these multiple readings of what it is, and then that actually would be lit down below, lit, lit through, and then down below is a kind of contemplative space. So you see the kind of shadow of the figure, and it's a very quiet space as opposed to the kind of chaos. Uh, and we were thinking very clearly about here are the artifacts, but here is this relationship to the mall. Uh, and how it gets seen, like there's that, which is a very early, which is basically our first representation is, okay, you have the image of the March on Washington, but then you have, right, you have the kind of image of the, the Washington Monument. And so that, that you're always kind of playing against, you know, both the spatial context of the mall, which in and of itself, which we sort of talk about in our boards, is alleged to have been a slave market at one point. So we understood that the mall had a very contested and complex history that isn't always admitted. Uh, and so we kind of tried to bring that up in, you know, in, in actually our boards uh, and, and had lots of debates, very interesting debates, precisely about this question of representation. What gets shown, what gets seen, what doesn't get seen um, in the work. And it was complicated. It was a very, very interesting. And, 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 you know, I really wanted to work on the project, so I contacted Liz and Rick about working on it. And then it, like, a month later showed up on their radar. And they're like, yeah, let's do this project. Um, but we had these really, and I, I wanted to work with them because I knew conceptually they would just get it. Like, it it, I wouldn't have to be like the person that's saying, but the history says. I mean, they're just, you know, they're, they're smart, you know, along with Charles, and they're really smart people. And so it's a very interesting process. And I worked on another museum with them at the same time called the Atlanta, Atlanta Center for C C Civil and Human Rights as well. So that was another project that was going on exactly at the same time in the office. I had to think through, it's a very long book. Um, but there were actually, there was a, the reason that Negro building happened, which I go in, in the chapter, I mean the chapter's really, really long in Atlanta, was that there were, there were two men that actually proposed something called the color, Colored Exposition um, about, about five years before that. And they went to the people who ran the, the basically um, had the, the fairgrounds in Atlanta. Uh, this is Grady, um, I don't know why I'm blanking on his name, the famous Grady that started the Atlanta Constitution. And they wanted to have a colored national exposition of their own. Um, and so they saw this as a potential venue just to speak to other blacks. Uh, and that same group, they were not able to get national funding and also raised corporate, literally through the corporation, exposition corporation, money to actually do this. But a lot of those people that were involved then went to the organizer of the Atlanta Fair and said, we would like to participate in some way. So they had remembered that project, and so they, uh, so they were willing to sort of do it, which is a very kind of radical move. But Atlanta was an industrial city. It wasn't part of the plantation. You know, like it wasn't a port city like Charleston or New Orleans. New Orleans had had a cotton state exposition that had a colored exhibit before. And again, the same people. So what's interesting is you see these same people again and again. But what's interesting is there's a very famous bishop and black nationalist named Henry McNeil Turner. Um, who was a part of, he spoke at the Cotton, Cotton States Exposition in New Orleans, he was involved in this colored exposition, he was a big advocate, he appears in the Constitution in the black newspapers advocating for the Negro building in Atlanta and does his own exhibit because he had spent a fair amount of time in Africa, in Liberia. And so he has an exhibit of black craft, he says, you know, that the knowledge that was brought um, uh, to the plantations, had a long history in Africa, Af you know, that the blacks here were always making things, they were always craftsmen. And so Turner sees the plantation um, uh, concession and he's with this, this writer from, I think, the Atlantic Monthly. And he says, 
those aren't Africans. Those are New Yorkers who are hired to be Africans. So he's verbally refuting, actually, what's being seen. And this gets published in, uh, I believe it's the Atlantic Monthly, basically. Um, and, so, and, the, and there was a very interesting debate around that, which I don't research thoroughly, but Christopher Reed who is um, who's a scholar who actually writes about the Dahomey village in Chicago, right, and who basically says the, that the Africans who, who actually did come from Africa for that exhibit were being positioned one way in the rhetoric, but they themselves were very dignified, they showed their craft, their community, they were proud, they showed how they were farmers, and you know, so that they themselves saw that they were presenting their culture to these other people. Uh, and so it gets read one way, but it, by, by one group of people, or even presented in media that way, but you know, exactly what's happening is a very complex, I think, negotiation of it, which I don't, I don't really research Buffalo, but I would suspect a very similar thing happened as well. Right. Black history starts from emancipation forward. Uh, and so there's a complete cutoff in Washington's kind of narrative um, about black progress, where it's interesting because Du Bois, you know, which I write about in the book, does this pageant about Africa and um, the, the star of Ethiopia, which I show. Um, and it tells, it tells a visual narrative of the Middle Passage and about life in Africa and the civilizations and so forth. So yeah, so there's a very contested, I think, ideas and representation. And I believe you had a question. Yeah. is because many of them were born in the US, many were Caribbean slaves that were actually born, born in the Caribbean and then brought to New York because it was a port. Um, and so this idea of African is complicated. There are British soldiers who are buried there. <laughs> you know, like, so this idea that it's a singular African, whatever African as a monolithic thing means, really elides, I think, a very complex history of who got buried there and why in that way. It's on Duane Street, uh, and it's right next to the federal office, this large federal office tower. It's just north of Tweed Hall. And it's kind of tough, it's very hard. It's the, the site, the, the burial ground, or um, the memorial is on that site, but the, 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 the actual precinct of it is much bigger than what's marked. Um, so, yes. Yeah, it's funny. 
this question about well, who, what do you know about people and what they saw and how were they impacted? It's very difficult to gauge that because they just didn't, you know, you didn't do, you know, a form at the end and say I liked it and you know. Uh, but I, I was able to dig up certain. The newspapers were a primary vehicle through which, and the, these expositions are particularly the the. the um, the emancipation expositions are diff difficult because they weren't cataloged as well as the mainstream expositions. Primarily resources, time, space to store all that stuff. Um, and so you f just find it spread all over archives and so much was lost. Uh, and also that sense of how did people respond um, to it as well. But newspaper accounts actually do. And I did find some debates about what was shown, like the, there was a historical society, very, very well known historical society in Washington, D.C where there was an African-American woman who had put together part of the DC exhibit and she had gone, she came back and she was very disappointed with what Booker T. Washington said. She says, no, this is not the position we should be taking. We should not be forfeiting our rights. And she was very adamant about that. Um, but then there were also sort of accounts um, just in white newspapers who some, you know, just sort of disparaged what they saw that was mediocre, you know, we can't believe that this is even being shown here. And others were just completely astonished, saying this is absolutely amazing, this is phenomenal. So, so you do get that. And it was, it was a, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was completely open to, to white fairgrounds. Walk you all over to um, 